just compete. Welcome. Let's start today's side event. We have very talented panelists for this side event today. Not only do we have very informed faculty from various respectable universities and academic societies today, we also have a specialist from World Health Organization from Geneva, Switzerland, and a youth leader for youth perspectives from South Korea. Please feel free to contact our panelists directly. If you have any questions, send them directly. Their email addresses and details are listed in the speakers list. If you wish to write your questions in the chat box, please do so, and we will make sure the speakers yes. get it. Uh, let's, let's get this side event started. Uh, I'm the first one today. Uh, okay. Here. All right. All right. Healthy aging is a challenging issue uh, and a new framework is essential in all the UN and WHO member states, rich and poor alike. The United Nations General Assembly had declared 2021 to 2030, the decade of healthy aging. The aim is not only to add years to the life but also quality of life to these years. By adopting a UN-wide approach in support of healthy aging, we will be able to galvanize international to improve the lives of older people, their families, and all our communities. Today's agenda is various speakers will address these topics social and economic inclusion for healthy aging, sustainable developmental goals and healthy aging, healthy adolescents and healthy adults, promoting healthy aging and equity of care, climate change and population aging, and number six, digital literacy for our seniors, which is essential for day-to-day -day life and interactions. Never underestimate the power of communication. And in all realities and honesty, healthy aging starts from the childhood and the beginning of life. Health is central to our experience of older age and the opportunities that aging brings. Aging of the population impacts our health systems, but also other aspects of society, including labor and financial markets, and the demand for goods and services, such as education, housing, long-term care, social protection, and information. It thus requires a whole of society approach. A new framework for global action for healthy aging is required. Despite the predictability of population aging and its accelerating pace, the world is not sufficiently prepared to respond to the rights and needs of older people. Women's Health and Education Center's initiatives for healthy aging are based on ability to meet basic needs of older people, ability to learn, grow, and make decisions, ability to be mobile, ability to build and maintain relationships and ability to contribute to the society's purpose in life is very important and to the world. Women's Health and Education Center focuses on these key areas and cross-cutting issues. Number one, combating ageism, enabling autonomy, Supporting healthy aging in all policies and art at all levels of government. As people age, their healthcare needs tends to become more chronic and complex. Currently, 
most of the time, health issues are managed in a disconnected and fragmented manner. Our action plan is designed to enhance different domains or abilities and encourage different sectors to improve functional ability. Yes, it is a time for a global action. It is time to realize that aging and health is a global issue. It should be considered as an essential component of the continuing globalization process that is reshaping our world. Governments, international and regional organizations, civil society, the private sector, academia, and the media are encouraged to actively support the UN General Assembly's goals of decade healthy aging. Effective delivery techniques and our recommendations are number one, creating a friendly environment. Please mute your please mute your uh, speakers. Creating age-friendly environments, creating equitable and sustainable mechanism for financing care, recognizing long-term care as an important public good, defining the roles of government and developing the services that will be necessary to fulfill them, and enhancing legislation supporting flexible arrangements or leave for of absence for family caregiver. Sex, sexuality, and aging. The sexual health of older people is often overlooked both in academic discourse and policy responses to rapid population aging. Maybe because the subject of sexuality in older people remain largely a taboo in many cultures. Women's Health and Education Center, uh, continuing medical education projects and programs include special courses on population aging and sexual health. Investing in healthy aging can enable individuals to live longer, healthier, and happier lives, and for societies to reap the dividend. Here are the key facts. In 2019, the number of people aged 60 years and over was 1 billion. This number will increase to 1.4 billion by 2030 and 2.1 billion by 2050. Loneliness and social isolation are key risk factors for mental health conditions in later life. Approximately 14% of adults age 60 or over live with mental disorders. Currently, more than 55 million people have dementia worldwide, over 60% of whom live in low and middle income countries. Every year, there are nearly 10 million new cases. Women are disproportionately affected by dementia both directly and indirectly, women experience higher disability-adjusted life years and mortality due to dementia, but also provide 70% of care hours for people living with dementia. In 2019, the cost of dementia management was 1.3 trillion US dollars. Final tips and takeaway messages are, Women's Health and Education Center works to enable voice and meaningful engagement by developing and supporting others to use innovative methodologies for amplifying voices, empowering them to influence and implementation of healthy aging policies. And WHEC works to build leadership and capacity building by developing learning opportunities, mentorship programs, and other tools that can help create a global community of change agents. Join the movement. Thank you very much. And let us now, let us change how we think, feel, and act towards age and aging. And that's... 
Okay. Now it is indeed my pleasure to give floor to Dr. Ritu Sadana from WHO headquarter, Geneva, Switzerland. Her work in healthy aging is legendary. Here is the floor is yours. Okay, well, um, Rita, thank you so much. And also to the Women's Health and Education Center for organizing this session. Uh, I just want to note that I'm an epidemiologist and economist, and I'm leading uh, the WHO uh, work stream on aging and health. Uh, and I worked closely to develop our first global strategy on aging and health back in 2015, 2016, and sowed the seeds for the UN Decade of Healthy Aging with the government of Japan and then later with um, the governments of Finland and Chile uh, that uh, really pushed this forward, uh, both within WHO and then at the UN General Assembly. Uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to be able to contribute to today's session that's also discussing healthy aging from a life course perspective. Um, next slide, please. So I'd like to talk uh, about three different things. And I think, um, Rita, you've already set up part of my uh, introduction. So that's terrific uh, in terms of, you know, what, what are we framing as healthy aging very briefly and some results from uh, a major baseline analysis we did a couple of years ago. Why we're proposing healthy aging should be considered across the life course and then I'll end on some reflections on what this new perspective on longer lives means. And my aim is to, uh, to uh, contribute to the aim of this session on appreciating the potential um, of so social and economic impacts of improved life expectancy. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what, do we, what do we mean by healthy aging? So uh, if we go to the next slide, the way WHO has uh, formed it is that it's really a process. It's a process towards enabling functional ability. And um, what we mean by that is that uh, everyone has an intrinsic capacity that's developed and that comprises all of the physical and mental capacities that a person can draw on. One could say within the mind and the body. And of course, there's many determinants of that. Uh, it also means the interaction with your environment writ large. So the environment includes, as Rita mentioned, uh, uh, social norms and perspectives about ageism. It also includes uh, the types of services and policies that are available to older people, not only from the health sector, but also uh, in education, in labor, in social protection, um, and, uh, and the enabling environments in general, like age-friendly environments. And what we've proposed is that the interaction between a person's intrinsic capacity and, and an environment which hopefully is enabling, but sometimes we know that's not the case, um, then produces a person's ability. Uh, and that those range of abilities, which Rita also mentioned, um, is enabling someone to, uh, to achieve well-being. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I'm listing here those different abilities that uh, older people themselves thought were very important uh, to enable their well-being. And just to note that unlike infants or maybe even young children, we can't have a checklist saying, you know, if an older person sees three people a week, then they're doing fine. Or if an older person is able to see uh, their coordinated care professional once a month, they're doing fine because everyone has different needs and expectations. And an older person um, has a whole history behind them. So what they desire is uh, can be very different. And rather than saying this is the checklist, we've identified these five areas. There are others as well, but these were kind of the most important 
uh, areas, uh, which we thought would be really important to stress what can be done. And uh, in the WHO baseline report for the decade of healthy aging, we give examples from around the world on what can be done in each of these areas where policymakers and uh, older persons and others in society uh, work together to identify what are the things that can be done, how are those programs or policies evaluated, how can they be scaled up, and there is a time pressure because we'd like to see meaningful change by 2030, uh, how can we accelerate action? So I encourage you to look at the report. It's just a report, but uh, we spent a lot of effort to put in examples from around the world. Next slide, please. So just focusing on one of those areas, uh, the ability to learn, grow, and make decisions, um, just to unpack that a little bit more, um, it can mean to challenge negative attitudes and stereotypes. Um, it can also mean to improve literacy in older people, it can be both literacy in the classic sense. It could also be financial literacy or digital literacy. Uh, it's enabling uh, policymakers and communities to invest in accessible opportunities for lifelong learning and growth. And uh, at the individual or household level is to really facilitate choice and control by the individual. Um, next slide, please. So what capacities, if we go back to the idea of healthy aging, could support that ability? So um, when we did this cross-national, uh, cross international comparative study, uh, we, we did get data from 55 countries. We could only use data from about a little under 40, um, which of course is only about 25% of the countries in the world, but it's the maximum we could achieve at that time. We, could, we, we did have one indicator uh, looking at cognitive capacity, uh, and that was uh, delayed word recall. And uh, what we found uh, is that uh, this is cross-sectional data, but we looked at adults from age 60 onwards. Uh, each dot is a different country in the, uh, in the vertical line. And, uh, and it's a summary of that age, single age in each country. So there's like 35 to 40 dots on each vertical line. And what, what we could see is that from age 60 to onwards, um, the rate of cognitive decline by age has a strong social gradient. So it very much was associated with older person's highest level of educational attainment. Um, and this is important to know because uh, we want to not only improve the individual's cognitive capacities, we want to maintain them, and we want to understand what can we do to shift the entire uh, curve upwards. Um, and I'll come back to that or we can discuss that uh, at, at, in, in a moment. Um, next slide, please. We also looked at environments uh, and uh, we looked at nine different indicators through an innovative way of capturing information from Google Maps, something everyone who has the access to Google Maps uh, uh, you can't do it exactly the same, but if you're in a, in a city and you want to know where's the closest park, you either look at the map or you can find out pretty quickly. And you can also find out how long it takes to bicycle there, walk there, or drive there. So we kind of captured this material for a lot of cities around the world, including Tokyo, on nine different indicators. And one of them was how close are parks and um, how, how quick can you get there? This is important, this indicator, because uh, environments play a crucial role in promoting healthy aging and ensuring that no older adult um, is left behind. And access to green spaces is highly correlated with better cognitive and psychological capacities. It also, it, there are some studies where we see that uh, maintaining in uh, the ability to access green spaces and have physical activity at the same time uh, uh, optimizes and delays declines 
in cognitive capacity. Even if it's slight delays at a population level, that makes a big difference. Uh, next slide, please. So that was cross-sectional data, but we also have uh, researchers around the world, uh, including those who've worked on the ATLOS project, who have put together longitudinal data sets. And this figure represents uh, data from 26 countries where they put together a series, a, a range of different indicators uh, and came up with an index for healthy aging. So it, it kind of contains whatever they could get either on capacities or abilities. It's not perfect, but it's quite interesting nevertheless, as they found um, looking at uh, a lot of people in these 26 countries, nationally representative, uh, they followed them for a 10 year period. And what, what they found was that, um, that, uh, that people who had a high starting point, actually a positive result, about 72% stayed at a high level over those 10 years. And it's really important to know what are the characteristics about these people and their environment. Then there was another group, about 25%, that started actually fairly low and were low pretty much through those 10, 10 years. But there was also a group, a little bit over 3%, where they started high, but they had a rapid decline um, from high to low levels. And it's really important that we can identify those people as best as we can to see how can we prevent such a rapid decline. So what this really shows us is uh, healthy aging does not start at age 60. And we need to build reserves earlier on. We may think that's obvious, but a lot of policies don't actually consider the cumulative advantages or disadvantages that older people may experience. So this is something why we're going to be promoting uh, healthy aging from a life course perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So working with um, our uh, WHO, as you may know, has seven main offices, uh, not only in Geneva, but we have six regional offices around the world. And they each regional office has uh, people who are working on uh, whether it's maternal, newborn, child, adolescent, women's, men's health, or aging. And so we are working together to, to see how we can promote this and work with others. So next slide, please. So first of all, why we want to take a life course perspective is that those intr intrinsic capacities, including cognition, uh, uh, sensory abilities, um, physical uh, uh, capacities, as well as um, uh, uh, um, uh, others uh, that, that we talk about, um, we know it matters that early development and during critical stages or period of life can be influenced by a range of factors that are biological, socioeconomic, environmental. So um, early risks to health and well-being in pregnancy, childhood, and adolescence, for example, are associated with 70% of mental health illnesses, whereas NCDs uh, later, uh, in later years, uh, as well as 25% decrease in social and economic contributions to society, which was one of those important abilities for older persons. Um, next slide, please. Another reason is that um, social determinants of health add further insights into the cumulative health impact of socioeconomic disadvantage or privilege that sort people into different life course trajectories um, at early ages or in adolescence or even uh, later in life. This also recognizes intergenerational transmission of health inequities that can alter health, a healthy aging trajectory healthy aging, you could say healthy optimal development and healthy aging trajectories from birth. But it also recognizes that reserve capacities, remember that rapid decline group, can be built up and optimized in each life stage. Next slide, please. 
So what, what could this mean if we visualize an optimal trajectory? Well, here is a dotted line on top that shows if in every life stage, we enhanced reserve, and if we were able to delay declines and also prevent declines that are preventing people to do what they want to do, given those abilities, through a supportive environment, you could still maintain an optimal ability, even if you have some declines in physical or mental capacities. So that's what we're calling as an optimal trajectory. So you don't have to be disease free to experience the process of healthy aging. But we also need to look at individuals and the line on the bottom, the black line, shows negative exposures using kind of epidemiological terms. Those are those arrows pointing downwards uh, that occurred, occur uh, uh, at any point in time with positive exposures uh, that can be based on things that happen in the environment. Uh, it could be in the community or the household as well as individual choices. And these can occur throughout the life course as well. Um, and this is of course something that we need to be able to measure that appropriately and also understand best what are those interventions that um, can bump people up. Uh, next slide, please. And so that brings me to the third reason of having um, the perspective of healthy aging across the life course is that all of these, almost all of these underlying determinants um, are amenable to policy change. Remember those up arrows uh, that I, I didn't go over in detail, but in the previous slide. And policies need to recognize that many people are living longer with one or more diseases or conditions, and yet they can be supported to optimize their physical and cognitive capacities to experience health and well being. These should promote healthy trajectories that connect each life stage and recognize that experiences at each stage and also reflect the critical transitions between them because these strongly influence current and future health and well being. Next slide. So I mentioned that um, at WHO, we're working with a lot of researchers and institutes and research centers around the world who do work on life course policy. And we've come up with um, five principles to put in practice a life course approach. One is to focus on the whole person. So although diseases and the management and prevention of diseases are very important, we're not taking a multi-morbidity perspective. Instead, we wanna focus on the person and making sure that we consider their capacities and abilities, recognizing the importance of managing and preventing disease. We also want action as early as possible. That doesn't mean all action is only at maternal and child stages but that in each life phase, there are actions that can take place and they should take place. Um, we also want to ensure that uh, actions are taken together, uh, including across different sectors. Health is one, education, uh, labor, social protection, among others. We also wanna promote health equity because we wanna optimize those trajectories at every point possible. And we want to inc be inclusive of groups who may otherwise be on the margins or be um, uh, uh, even discriminated. And finally, we want to put in place appropriate action. And appropriate action should be evidence-based and uh, that can be resourced so that it reaches all people. So this framework will be soon uh, we're expecting it to come out in about two months, and uh, we'll be delighted to share it to, for those who are interested. Next slide, please. So just to end on a, a, a little bit of reflection and some evidence on uh, a new perspective on longer lives. 
Next slide, please. There have been people who have already been talking about that, um, you know, in the 20th century, uh, we had built up after, uh, uh, after World War II in a lot of countries, systems and policies that took a very linear approach to life course. Life expectancy was, you know, at best between 60 and 65 for even high income countries. And of course, now it's, you know, 20 to 30 years more. But at that time, there were few opportunities for variation or support for different choices outside of this predetermined path. You go to school, you work, and then you retire, and you hopefully live a few years before you die. If we go to the next slide, what we're seeing now is that uh, there's, for some countries, uh, life expectancy is uh, nearing, on average, well over 85 years. And um, we still are concerned about uh, 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 there is a, still a big set of countries that we're concerned about where life expectancy on average is still around 60 years of age. But we know that life expectancy is increasing and well-off groups in every country are much higher than the average um, in, in, in each country. And what we would like is that systems are redesigned so that people can have a much more modular approach to, to the way their lives unfold. Um, and this should require not only uh, a new, more evidence, but also that uh, our systems are linked, not based on chronological age, because we know there's a lot of variation in people's intrinsic mind and body capacities, but based on what those capacities are, as well as um, the abilities that this particular society has agreed is important. Um, and we can have a lot of discussion about, um, about that, but if you think about 200 years ago, where the average life expectancy was below 40, and now you consider how long our lives are, that is a radical transformation in terms of how people can meaningfully uh, achieve their own goals, their family goals, as well as societal goals. We are in the cusp of a similar transformation and we need to be able to draw on that. So I'll just quickly mention uh, a couple of things and then, and then close. Next slide. So uh, a group from Chile did an fantastic piece of analysis where they looked at 12 longitudinal studies, looking at how older persons transitioned from being working full-time to what they did after they stopped working full-time. And what we see is it's not a one-time transition from work to retirement. There are multiple transitions. Uh, they looked at five, they, they, they cap, uh, captured five different approaches. There's much more flexibility. There's a lot of difference between men and women based on the policies in place as well. But one key message is we should reverse, perverse incentives that force older people in poor health with limited financial resources to keep working. And at the same time, we should not prevent older people who would like to work longer, they should be able to keep working and not have a forced uh, uh, mandatory retirement age. Next slide, please. Uh, we also need to recognize that households that do have uh, older people who have declines in functioning or cognitive capacity tend to be the ones that have the most out-of-pocket payments for health. And that should not be the case. We need to have much more solidarity in ensuring that older, all older persons are covered by universal health coverage. This slide shows representative data from 133 countries, including high, middle, and low-income countries, showing that in the red category at the very top are, uh, are, are uh, poorer households 
who have much higher rates of catastrophic spending with you know, poorer households with dependent older adults have much higher rates of catastrophic spending. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. If we look at development assistance for, uh, uh, for different health conditions, uh, this is a, a little bit old data, but it's really the best study we can find um, where uh, the development assistance, which is aid from high income countries, to low and middle income countries by age group for health. The, 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 uh, the bars in purple are, the, uh, are actually the amount of the funding that went collectively to different age groups. So there's a big amount uh, at the beginning of life and then it rises a bit in middle life and it tapers down as people get older. For the conditions that people have older. In the gray are actually the distribution of burden of disease. Uh, and we can see there's a mismatch. The idea is not that there needs to be a perfect mis uh, match up. This is just a heuristic, but that there's a great opportunity to better synchronize our resources across the life course um, so that we also are inclusive of this growing population of older persons that Rita mentioned at the very beginning. Um, next slide. So I think uh, making older persons visible is a big step in having a life course approach to healthy aging. And so we just, re we just released a report uh, uh, at the uh, commission on, um, uh, on the stats commission at the UN uh, in March where we did, we worked with the Titchfield City Group on age and age disaggregated data. It's made up of national statistics offices led by uh, the UK ONS and many UN agencies uh, and WHO, uh, myself working with the Ghanaian Statistical Office, we led the development of this report, which looks at, uh, we prioritized out of all the SDG indicators, 46 that were most important for older persons. So governments have already agreed that this is important data. And we worked with 20 different national statistics offices who each illustrated one of those uh, indicators. We, we only illustrated 20. Our goal is next time all 46. But they show with national data, disaggregated information and how that's reported and used in policy processes. It's just one step to make clear, how can we make older persons visible? So I know I've taken a lot of time and I just go to the next slide and I'd like to uh, thank you again and just note that everything we do, we recognize that older persons themselves are drivers of change. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much, Ritu. It was very informative and eye-opening. Now I let me introduce Dr. Raja Worthington, consultant in ethics and global health. And he will be presenting his, uh, uh, his uh, presentation with youth uh, leader, Minty Kang from South Korea and Dr. Colleen Kraft, who was 2018 President of American Academy of Pediatrics. And they will address on sustainable developmental goals, healthy adolescents and healthy adults. Go ahead, Roger. Thank you, Rita. Um, I hope uh, you can hear me and, and see my screen. Um, so, um, well, I have to say after that amazing talk um, by Ritu, it's a hard act to follow, but uh, I will uh, push through and, and not take too much time. So I want to talk a little bit more about the SDGs in relation to healthy aging with a particular focus on ethics, equity, and changing demographics. Uh, uh, so yes, I won't spend time on that, um, but I'm very pleased to be uh, assisted by a former student and now a research assistant, uh, a young scholar and youth leader, Min Che Kang, who will just uh, contribute in the middle of my presentation, and then I will hand over to uh, Professor Kraft. So we're all familiar with the goals. So I'm focusing really on, on three and five today. Um, I mean, there is no single development goal that is specific to aging, but as we've already heard, um, there are many of the targets that are extremely relevant 
Um, so um, I'm focusing on, on two targets in particular, 3.8 and 3C, which address uh, universal health care and the need for adequate funding and, and resources, particularly in relation to workforce issues. So um, just to sort of cross-reference um, some joined up thinking, um, we've already heard about uh, the new report, uh, so uh, which WHO have issued on making older persons visible uh, in the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and so I've embedded the link there. I won't go into it now just to save time. Um, and, and this is a, a quote from the introduction. So as we now, as we've already heard, humans now live longer than at any time in history. Global life expectancy has doubled since 1900 and continues to rise, although there remains a wide disparity between countries with the shortest and the longest life expectancy. So in terms of demographic trends, uh, yes, we, we are on a trajectory we, uh, in terms of aging, but yes, I agree the situation differs markedly between countries. So we've got countries like Japan, uh, China, South Korea, we're going to hear more about South Korea in a moment, um, where in these countries, the aging population um, is a real cause of, of concern um, at, at national level, whereas we've got other countries that are in stark contrast um, India, Nigeria, South Africa, for example, all have young populations um, and high birth rates. Um, and uh, this data was uh, derived from a recent paper in, in the Lancet, which uh, talks about the fertility levels declining globally. Um, and I will come on to, to, to that in a moment. Um, so in terms of examples, the percentage of population in China that is over 65 um, is 14%. Um, which is double um, that percentage that uh, is currently prevalent in, in South Africa uh, and India. So we get these enormous differences. Um, and that is also um, UN data from the dashboard there, and which you'll see in the link. Um, and of course, it's not just the, the fact that people are living longer, but the, the, the birth rate is, is crucially important if you're trying to sort of look at the, the demographic picture as a whole. Um, and to maintain a uh, population at a static level, you need a, a birth rate of around 2.1 uh, live births per woman. And China is now um, just over 1.7. So it has a falling population. And so if you factor that in with um, people living longer, um, it, it has a big um, impact in terms of socio-demographics, um, healthcare provision, and so forth. Um, whereas in South Africa, for instance, we've got the number of live births at 2.28 in India, uh, 2.11. Uh, so they, they have a growing and much younger population. Um, and uh, that is WHO data with a link included there. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Minche Kang now, who's going to talk us through some data from South Korea. So Minche, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Roger, Rod, Roger Worthington. Uh, so I'll be talking about falling and aging population issue in Korea. Population issue in Korea has been very severe. Uh, compare, even compared to other nations. The slide right now that is shown on the screen is showing the population number decrease of 2023 compared to 2000. Uh, so just by looking at the raw data, it doesn't seem really heavy, but to think about the fact that this is a number that we're losing every uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 population of the whole population every year. It is very critical. The reason of reducing uh, uh, reducing population is due to the lowest birth rate that we're suffering through. So 0 0.73 birth per woman is the recent study. And the average from the OEC 2023 was 1.59. So compared to that, Korea has a very low birth rate and the number of children per woman needed to keep the total population constant, which was addressed by the OECD, was 2.1. So it is very low, and that is the reason why the population is keep decreasing. The reason of the lowest birth rate is often thought because of the rising social atmosphere of un unwelcoming the children and thinking the children is a burden. Uh, it is shown in the form of no kid zone or such things in Korea. And also as Korea, uh, as it is shown and written down, uh, Japan and Korea tends to think marriage and children as a one set. However, as marriage is something and being more expensive and children and to raise children as the expense is getting more uh, 
expensive. Uh, people tend to not marry, and also this atmosphere made the policy such as sperm donation not to be placed in Korea or Japan. So it's causing more birth rates and uh, women to be more afraid of having children. Next page, please. And now I'll be talking about elders. Korea is also a very aged society. And the reason why is because we have a very long life expectancy. Uh, Korea's average life expectancy is 83.6 years and OECD's 2021 20, average was 18.3 years. However, the problem is that these elders are being isolated from the society. The elders are going through mental, mental health issues, poverty issues, and also they're being isolated from people and city. So although all suicides are very tragic, the suicides of elders are more rising in Korea and it's double the number of the OECD. OECD average elder suicide rate was 17.2 per um, two. However, Korea is 39.9. So it is very tragic and alarming, and especially in the way that the people who have been living in our community at least for 65 years are ending their lives as a suicide. It is very alarming and shows that our society has a lot of issues that we should uh, go through and has to take care of elders properly. Thank you. And I'd like to hand to Dr. Kraft. Uh, well, I'll, I'll pick up from there, but uh, thank you very much, Menchi, I appreciate that. Um, that was some, some really useful information. So as we see, um, aging populations have different causes. Um, and in China, for instance, they have long had an interventionist policy. Uh, if you think back to the years and years when they had the one child policy, and although that has, has gone, um, they are now sort of intervening the opposite way, trying to create all kinds of incentives to encourage people to have families. Um, and I think um, South Korea is, is doing the same thing um, to, to try and uh, reverse this trend in, in some way. Um, so yes, certainly, as Minchie was saying, the high cost of living is an important factor. Um, also, sort of slightly perversely in a way, um, you know, if, if women have access to better education um, and better access to healthcare, including reproductive health, they are possibly more likely to put career first um, and maybe have a family later or possibly, you know, not at all. Uh, I haven't, I'm not offering data on that, but it's just a, a, an observation. So what do we think in terms of the ethics here? Um, and it's, I can't really answer this in a short space of time, but it's a rhetorical question, if you like. It's how far should governments interfere with private lives when it comes to family planning? Because if there's too much interference, absolutely, it overrides people's autonomy. But at the same time, if governments don't act, if they don't think about these things, um, then it will create an undue burden on society. Um, and uh, we're already seeing countries where there are not enough young people of working age to support those who are no longer economically active um, and those who are in need of, of care and support. So the implications here are significant in terms of both equality and equity. Um, so I said I wanted to uh, talk briefly about gender. So gender equality should help um, create conditions that allow for mature debate on these issues uh, within society. And gender equity, in other words, fairness towards women, um, helps them to exercise their rights on reproductive decision making. Um, and that, of course, needs, you know, is directly linked to access to healthcare. But it's worth noting that neither of these, these two objectives are possible um, in terms of equity and equality you know in countries that function as a patriarchy um, and uh, some countries some uh, some women are choosing not to have um, start a family for environmental reasons I mean I, I've I've heard of several instances where people are saying well they're very very worried about climate change and and global population now that may or may not be considered a valid reason but it's uh, it's a perhaps a small factor but of course, if that became a wider issue, that would have a, a knock-on effect. So um, just to, I do think it's important to put this in the context of universal health care. Um, and I was you know, pleased to hear uh, Ritu you know, talking about that and stressing the importance of it. And the picture here is very mixed, just as it is in terms of population and demographics. China has made dramatic progress in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, but other countries really are slightly backwards. And there was a big blow to women's health in the United States uh, two years ago when the Supreme Court 
overturn the famous Roe v. Wade case, um, and that has restricted women's right to healthcare, um, and specifically in terms of their reproductive health. Um, and for largely political reasons, universal health care was never a priority in the United States, um, which you know means that in terms of the United States meeting its goals towards SG3 as a whole, it's going to be very difficult. Um, and very briefly, um, in terms of financing, recruitment and so forth, this is the one of the targets. Um, it's, it's crucial to have... Um, an adequate workforce, because if you think in terms of the demographics, the aging population, um, um, you know, particularly affecting some countries, um, worldwide there is a shortage of doctors and nurses, and some countries are suffering that more than others. Some of it is perhaps policy driven because not enough money has been channeled into the healthcare system, or not enough there's not enough workforce planning um, to train doctors and nurses. This is something that governments must think about. Again, I had to put this as a rhetorical question because there isn't time to debate it, but the extent to which it's ethical to recruit healthcare professionals from countries that may already have shortages of their own um, is really open to question. I think an outright ban would be, first of all, very difficult to, if not impossible to impose, but secondly, of course, there are um, innovative ways of doing this, whereby a country such as UK, which has been doing this now for some time, encouraging doctors to come over, say from countries like India, they do a graduate program, they get high qualifications, experience, they help work in the National Health Service, and then they go back home and they take their experiences um, and knowledge with them uh, to benefit the local community. So in summary, there are no quick fixes. These are complex issues, but I think to make real progress here, it's a question as much as uh, is anything of having political will um, and reasoned debate. And with that, I will hand over to my friend and colleague, um, Colleen Craft. Colleen. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and move through some of the crystallizing, really, some of the ideas behind the whole life course approach to healthy children, healthy adolescents, healthy aging. Let's go on to the next slide. One of the best studies that has looked at this has been the Carolina Abbott Sedarian study. And this talks about do early environments make a difference? What they did in the 1970s is they randomized kids living in poverty to two groups, one group getting the typical services child children got, so Medicaid and food stamps and WIC, no preschool. And the other half were had in addition to these a quality preschool with eight hours a day, health care, nutritious meals, cognitive and social stimulation. And what they looked at afterwards were demographics, health evaluation, lab tests, personality and behavior. And if you go on to the next slide, what we knew early on is that every $1 spent was at least a $7 healthy return in healthy adolescents. And these are adolescents who are less likely to fail a grade, more likely to graduate from college and high school, more likely to have a skilled job, stronger social emotional skills, less drinking and more physically active. But the next slide is really the kicker. What has happened at the microbiologic level, at the physiologic level, 40 years after participants in Abbasidarian were looked at, what they found is the kids who were in that positive social environment had lower blood pressure, lower systolic and diastolic blood pressure. They had lower LDL lipid levels and higher HDL, which is the good cholesterol levels. Fewer of these kids were obese. A quarter of the control typically have metabolic syndrome. There was nobody in that preschool group that had metabolic syndrome, which is a pre-diabetes. And the whole cardiovascular risk score was twofold lower in the kids that had that healthy, supportive environment. So this really proves that the environment is something that even shows effects at the microbiologic and physiologic level as people age. And if we go on to the next slide, this is really what's behind the whole current conceptual framework guiding early childhood policy and practice, that we can get this healthy developmental trajectory from supportive relationships, health-promoting environments. If you click twice more, uh, Roger, what we know is that when there's significant adversity, there's impaired health and development, and that in that environment and those health services are really so important. Come on to the next slide. So I'm going to introduce the concept of epigenetics. We know what genetics are. They're the proteins that DNA makes. Epigenetics is the environment around that DNA that tells us which proteins, when are they made, how much are they made, 
it really is the environment around that child who is growing up in that healthy environment, even though they're a child living in poverty, that might actually result in better microbiological metrics. On to the next slide. So what's the environment and its effect on healthy aging? There's very good data looking at nutrition, clean water, housing, stable housing, employment, and really going back to what Richu had to talk about as well, too, with, you know, when when should you continue to be employed? Is 65 the age you should retire or is it different for different people, which I think we would all we would all sense that that's different. Healthcare access, the whole idea of social engagement versus isolation, activity versus physical disability, and then executive function versus mental illness and dementia. Go on to the next slide. Because what we know is that just like what we saw with the Abyssalarian study, we know that there's a path from poor adolescent health to aging. So if there's early trauma and stress, you are more likely to have slower language and learning, attentional problems, aggressive behavior, people self-medicate, then you're going to have a higher, higher incidence of alcohol use, tobacco, illicit drugs. What we see in our social range is special education, school dropout, and then that leads to adult stress, stress which are low-wage jobs, unemployment, prison, chronic health problems. And, and this is really the, the opposite pathway. This is what we see epidemiologically from poor adolescent health to, to aging, where we saw in the first example what a great environment really looked at at the microbiologic level. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, and, and I think it's important to know that there are some solutions. There are places that are piloting things that are really looking at how do we get from a healthy adolescence to healthy aging. Humanitas Netherlands, is a great program where adolescent students live with the elderly. So there is social connection, but there's also mentorship. There's giving back. And this is something that our elderly have to do. We, you know, we all, giving back is something that keeps us going. In, and this is the program where that happens. And they found that there are better outcomes for both the adolescents and the elderly residents. Next slide. There is a program in Ireland where youth are giving a voice to older adults. And really to, to talk about both what Ritu and Rita talked about is that we talk about the youth voice very often. We don't talk about the elderly voice, aging and, and older individuals. But these were medical students in Ireland that led advocacy initiatives with the older adults. It wound up increasing funding for aging population and really opposed, opposed the privatization of nursing home care really, again, getting this much more community-based, and really took the voices of the elderly into consideration and gave them a voice to talk about what is it that we need to be healthy at our age. Next slide. And then finally, in India, there are intergenerational residential groups. And this has really been a pattern. If you think about this throughout history, we have had intergenerational residential groups. And this has actually changed very much in high-income countries. But there are many places in India where the elderly live with younger generations, and there's some really good data to show that if you live in these intergenerational residential groups, you have less chronic illness. They specifically measured asthma and tuberculosis. You have less acute illness. They specifically measured malaria and jaundice from liver disease, and that you have a greater sense of purpose, which is, again, the giving back that is really so important to as we as we build our adolescents and our young adults and our older adults and to make everybody be able to live their life to the fullest. At the end of my presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Colleen. I have to say um, real dedication because Colleen is speaking to us from an airport lounge. She's on a sort of lecture tour. So <laughs> thank you for finding the time and the space to talk to us. So um, Rita, back to you. Well, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. And let me introduce Dr. Vanati Gopalakrishnan, Associate Professor at University of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Her work and research for healthy aging is noteworthy. She will suggest recommendation for public goods to promote healthy aging and equity of care. Go ahead, Vanati. No, we can't hear you. Vanati, we can't hear you. Yeah, hi, Rita. Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me now? And can you see yes. my slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. 
Um, thank you so much. Good morning, and my name is Vanati Gopalakrishnan. Vanati means the Milky Way galaxy in uh, uh, an ancient language called Tamil. Uh, and I'm a tenured associate professor at the Department of Biomedical Informatics in the School of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Luthra, for giving me the, and, uh, this opportunity to speak uh, uh, in conjunction with the Women's Health and Education Centers uh, uh, United States CPD 57 annual uh, meeting side event. Uh, my talk will present recommendations for public goods to promote healthy aging and equity of care based on insights that I have gained from past two decades of uh, experience as an AI researcher of biomedical and health data with a passion to reduce uh, the global burden of disease. So in what follows, I will provide some insights, not only from my research, but also from those of reviewing the literature. Uh, so in September of last year, I created, uh, I had an aha moment and uh, created something called the algorithm for algorithms for healthy aging concept and created the first aha one as a containing three steps. So this might be interesting uh, and it might align with the sustainable development goals or SDGs three and four uh, of the UN. Um, so an algorithm refers to a sequence of steps and this simple first algorithm for healthy aging comprises of three steps. Uh, in step one, uh, you possess five senses, a sense of connection throughout the lifetime, a sense of body signals, which is the physiological awareness a sense of natural compassion, a sense of health and well-being in the form of gratitude or prayer, acknowledging the wealth in nature, and a sense of curiosity or how. Uh, how did this world come about? How does this work? And so on. Uh, step two involves the habit formation that thoroughly exercises all of these important physiological elements, such as systems of musculoskeletal organs, nerves, circulation, digestion, etc., and pay special attention to nourishment through the food and elimination aspects. I'll come to how this all connects uh, to the environment and to other things in a few seconds. Uh, and the step three uh, is ability to use the survival instincts to nourish habit formation and st strengthen the senses as per step one and step two. So it's a nice circle of care, if you will. Uh, so my own uh, eightfold path um, or eight recommendations for public goods for healthy aging and equity of care begins with this first aspect of connection. A lot of us spoke about it this uh, just today. And uh, I would suggest that uh, we adopt something that actually has a concept that's globally known called Ikigai or a reason for being. And uh, this Ikigai is a wonderful concept that was created by the Japanese. And if you, I'm not gonna get into the details of it, but what I'm suggesting is that we can use this as a useful global blueprint to educate people as one way to find balance, joy, purpose, and connection to their goals along their lifelong path. And my first recommendation therefore is to establish these knowledge transfer centers or chains called, for example, as ICHA, International Community House for Collective Healthy Aging as public goods to promote connections between older citizens and next generations, providing international intergenerational wisdom. And uh, ICHA refers to will and directed will towards healthy aging via appropriate connection would be a great goal for all of us across our lifespans. My second recommendation is based on an observation that eliminating toxic waste from our bodies and the environment is extremely important, as I have found in my studies uh, with cardiac event survival prediction. I could actually predict who is going to die uh, because of the amount of toxicity build up in their bodies. And it was a very accurate, 100 percent accurate predictor of death. And uh, this also indicates why sleep is so important for the human body, because the sleep removes toxins from the human body. So uh, the amount of sleep is very, very important for everybody. And uh, so I really 
think that um, we need to have discussions between the Environmental Protection Agency, education departments, health departments, and future schools, so that you can have integrated frameworks that cut across all these different aspects uh, and uh, can actually uh, look into innovative detection and remediation technologies, even for public health, uh, which are being developed by agencies in the United States. See, for example, the sustainable exposure prevention work cited above. And see also my uh, recommendation on how you can reduce the global chronic disease burden by taking care of the mitochondria. And I think this is important to start teaching uh, even at this age of school children as to how these things work, as uh, Colleen wonderfully alluded to the biology of things. Um, thirdly, I uh, re recommend participatory design of systems and policies by adopting efficient human machine survey agents with state-of-the-art AI. There will be, I think Edith is going to be talking right after me, and so she will uh, describe some of her efforts. Um, uh, but basically, um, we have done some recent research uh, that looked at uh, maybe like 24, 25 hospitals uh, maybe even up to 31 hospitals in a federated electronic health records data. And we were trying to study postpartum hemorrhage, thinking that the incidence rate of PPH was about 1 or 2% in the US. And we ended up uh, finding a curve like this, which actually showed a major increasing trend in the incidence rate of postpartum hemorrhage per 100,000 deliveries. We do not uh, know for sure if that might be because of cesarean section that many uh, women are now adopting to do, maybe unnecessary, maybe necessary. So there are lots of very interesting things we found, including the fact that Asian women uh, are one of the groups that showed the highest prevalence of PPH at 10%. And we interestingly found that African-American and uh, the uh, uh, white groups were showing roughly the same at 8% or so. Uh, we also showed that um, a single comorbidity yielded the lowest rates. So many, if you have multiple comorbidities, it increases the risk of all of these things. But this is just to give you a small example. We're still in the process of uh, making them, uh, uh, analyzing these results and making sure they're accurate and publishing them. So this brings me to the fourth recommendation, which is uh, part of SDGs four and five. Medical education and research should not only be used to improve equity through increased focus on women's health and female childhood through the uh, child health through the lifespan. There also needs to be an educational component that is covered appropriately in schools to increase student knowledge about parasitic infections, for example, and diets and methods for hygiene in terms of cooking and cleaning. And perhaps standardizing these methods across the globe can help decrease the number of chemicals that are introduced into our environments while retaining immunities in our bodies. So this is uh, the concept is that if we can standardize many of the methods that we use internationally, and that sort of goes flows with this idea of HR2, uh, is that we can reduce uh, many, uh, many toxic things that are going on while educating people carefully about uh, the various things that uh, can cause major problems in our body and cause health to decline and cause also major problems with respect to uh, e uh, equity of care. So these are the things that we really need to have collective participation in terms of education. The fifth recommendation is to do with mental health. And uh, I think it's important that we need to educate and remind people lifelong about our connected health, even as the planet, people are doing that. But the connected health has to do with also our collective well-being, that uh, we are not uh, single individuals who can do whatever they please. And uh, really, cooperation and collaboration are very key to an individual's survival and health. You need to implant this much, much early on into the children as we grow them, because uh, sooner or later, they're going to find out. And that is, uh, I think, very important. Cooperation and collaboration are keys to an individual survival and health through participatory vitality. Uh, the next one has to do with 
education uh, of uh, raising the economical and financial awareness in women and children. And one example of that is Professor Ganesh Mani from Carnegie Mellon University's Stepper School and Edith Luhanga, uh, who will be speaking right after me from CMU Africa, have created a FinTech research group which facilitates such inclusion. And the seventh recommendation has to do with uh, augmented AI in education for health equity. Uh, augmented technologies such as AR, VR are now being used to educate health professionals. These could be very useful as educational aids to help us understand health risks before they arise, before we reach a particular age, so that we can begin preventing age-related known problems and injuries. For example, things like you have to take care of your intervertebral discs. Make sure they're nourished and they're not injured because that's very crucial for aging. And uh, as the aging population becomes uh, grows into the number, it grows in billions, by 2050, we're going to need to make sure that all these education uh, of, uh, of how to reduce health risks is made properly. And I do believe that AR, VR, augmented uh, reality visualizations, and even hybrid programs that offer asynchronous education in multiple digital media formats can be very helpful in doing so. And my final recommendation is uh, covers a lot of the SDGs by focusing on prevention by creating gender specific and age specific guidelines for healthful living with a move towards eliminating bias due to social determinants of health, which are listed here. Uh, we have a report from the U US Department of Health and Human Services uh, for Healthy People 2030. And finally, uh, with a major focus on SDGs three, four and five, but also partly focused on SDGs 8 through 12. I look forward to building this global innovation center that we are calling as Bihar, which means actually to construct. We have initially formed partnerships with professors at the Hoeta Center for Digital Health uh, in IIT Mumbai, India, which is the number one technology institution in India and um, Carnegie Mellon University Africa in Rwanda with uh, Edith. Uh, we welcome more partnerships. Our mission is to conduct world-class research and training that empowers females of all ages across the world to take charge of their own health and well-being in collaboration with healthcare technology and systems, uh, including the development of uh, female digital health twins. And our vision is to become the world's premier innovation center of knowledge and practice in evidence-based girls and women's integrated health and wellness across the lifespan. Thank you uh, for your attention and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Venati. Now is Dr. Edith Luhanga from Carnegie Mellon University based in Kigali, Rwanda, Africa. Focus of discussion is on digital literacy for seniors in Africa. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Rita. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see my slides. As has already been spoken by Vanity, I my work primarily focuses on behavior change and how we build digital technologies to help people live healthier lives. The majority of my work so far has focused on maternal and children's health, and I've worked mostly with millennials. But as we've already heard from the earlier talks, um, Preparation really allows people to live healthier lives when they're older adults. So I'll be talking about some of the things we need to be considering when we're creating digital literacy programs for older adults in the African context. Uh, I believe it was Roger who gave us statistics on the proportion of older adults in the world. And Africa does have the youngest population, which begs the question, why should we even be talking about this now? And when you look at it in terms of Percentages, yes, we do have the lowest proportion, currently around 5.6% on average, which is roughly 74 million people. But fast forward just 26 years from now, the percentage has only increased to 9.3, but we now have more than 200 million people who are above 60 years old. 
and this will be the third largest number of older adults in the world after Asia and Europe. So it's really important to start understanding what are some of the lived experiences of older adults in Africa and what are some of the supporting systems that they need in place in terms of policies, in terms of interventions. And so we're seeing an increasing number of studies. I'll reference uh, these six studies you see here to each from Ghana, Ethiopia and South Africa to explain some of the challenges that are taking place, some of the technological solutions that might address these, but also what we need to consider in terms of digital literacy programs. So if you look at any of these countries, most of them, all three of them actually, talk about something to do with income insecurity and diminished functional ability, which we've already heard um, is the experience of older adults globally. But in Africa, it tends to be a bit more severe. So income insecurity comes partly because the percentage of uh, the work of the older adults who were in the formal workplace is relatively lower than many regions of the world, which means access to things like pension schemes is more limited. And so what we see as a trend on the continent is more multi-generational living with older adults either living with their older single children or their married um, children and grandchildren in the same home. But in countries like South Africa, which are relatively more developed than more, many of the other countries in Africa, we're also seeing an increasing number of adults migrating away from their hometowns and home cities for better work opportunities. I'm so excited um, for a bit. I don't mention. Sorry, somebody's on. Can you please mute? All right. Yes. Uh, Laura. Oh, yes, yes. And so, because you um, there, right? Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Yes, thank you. And so what we're seeing as people migrate away from their hometowns to in seeking better educational opportunities, what is happening more and more often is asking parents to take on that caregiver role. And so in South Africa, we actually see from the studies that having to um, physically provide for the children adds in increasing amount of disability because you're putting more pressure on the body. So functional uh, ability that is diminished over time, needing to provide care despite this is a challenge. And accessing healthcare because of costs, because of uh, distance, because of long queues with the very uh, low health worker force is also a challenge. But overall, what this means for people who are older in Africa is that there's an increasing feeling of insecurity uh, over aging because aging means losing choice. Aging means becoming a dependent. And when you can't become a dependent, becoming a provider, which is associated with greater disability. And so overall, the issues older adults face in Africa are the same globally. People want to have dignity as they age. People want to feel included and an active part of the community as they age. But more importantly, people want to have choice. And whether that choice means living in place, aging in place in their own homes, or being able to age but feel like a productive member of, a, uh, of the family in another person's home, these are all choices that they want to be able to make rather than made for them. And so at the core of it, we really need to support people to feel like they have greater ability to achieve all these four. Now we're seeing more policies around social support services to provide financial aid. What we're not seeing a lot more of is how do we promote dignity and uh, participation and choice? But we are seeing from the tech sector, a lot of people coming up with technologies to support this. So established technologies, and by established, I do not mean that they have penetrated the marketplace to a critical mass, but that they have been well-researched, they are already out there ready for adoption and use. We're seeing a lot of digital payment solution where Africa is pretty much the world leader in mobile money. And so we're seeing a lot of video conferencing solutions as well to address that um, sense of isolation. But we're also seeing more sensors being brought into the home from uh, fall detection technologies to smart lighting, doorbells, locks, assistance, and telehealth services all of these are becoming more available to support either aging in place with dignity or aging in another person's home with a bit more feeling of you have choice and you have ability to meet your physical needs. But we are also seeing a lot of research that is very AI heavy. So 
we've if you've been paying attention in the news autonomous cars seems to be the thing everybody's talking about but did you know that people are also talking about autonomous vehicles so self-driving wheelchairs sorry self-driving wheelchairs that can help navigate people more easily especially those with muscular dystrophy we also have smart glasses that are able to function much like a guide dog would you would speak out loud where you want to go and the glasses would create a path and guide you verbally when and how to avoid obstacles on your path. But we also also have auto captioning glasses, glasses that you put on to address um, hearing loss. They would caption all the conversations happening around you. We're seeing a lot of these technologies and it's exciting. And just as we saw cell phones um, move from the global north to the global south and be adopted a fast rate, I believe some of these technologies in the very near future, by 2050 at least, will also be adopted at a very fast rate in Africa. But now I want you to think about the last time a digital device you use, perhaps it's your smartphone or a smart TV, the last time it malfunctioned, how did you feel about that? If you knew how to address this problem, it was probably a minor inconvenience, you solved it, moved on with your life. If you did not know how to solve this problem or even why this problem started in the first place, then it was probably a very frustrating experience. And the level of frustration you experienced is likely related to how much help you needed to, figure, um, to get to solve this problem and how much time you had to go without a device you need uh, and figure out other ways to, let's say, communicate. Now, imagine being older and having these AI heavy technologies. In the past, in order for people to be able to use a digital device independently and safely, they probably just needed two skills understand the ICT words used, for example, what is Wi-Fi, but also just have basic technical skills, like how to turn a device off and on and how to install software and you're good to go. And you could also ask for a lot of support from the people around you in case you didn't know how to do this. But today's older adult needs to also understand fundamental computing concepts like how AI works. And sometimes people ask, well, why should people understand how AI works? And I liken it to driving a car. You don't need to know the mechanics of how a brake system is designed and how it works, but you do need to know that the harder you press on the brake pedal, the faster a car slows down and it will eventually stop. And this allows you to not only use the right amount of force, so effectively use that brake pedal, but it also allows you to know when the braking system is not working effectively and could be potentially dangerous. The same is true with AI. You need to be able to understand when it's not giving you the right outputs. So you could actively take the decision to say, I will not use this choice. But we also need media literacy now. There's a lot of deep fakes. There's a lot of AI generated content out there. There's a lot of people generated mis and disinformation. So if you want to independently and safely use digital devices today, you need to be able to identify what is credible from what is non-credible. And finally, you do need to understand cybersecurity and privacy. The more sensors you have in your home, the more likely you are to be a victim of, let's say, over surveillance. The more likely you are to be a victim of people stealing your passwords and accessing your financial accounts. All this to say, if you're an, old, if you're an adult today, not necessarily an older adult, even in your 20s, you need a wider variety of technical skills than even just 10 years ago. And the same is true for older adults. If we want them to be able to use these digital devices, they need a larger array. This is not something that can be easily solved by a one-time course. This is sometimes that needs continuous learning and even in-depth learning. But where Africa's challenge is, is that currently on the digital skills gap, we're below the average, the global average of six, we're going between 1.8 to five, and only 50% of African countries have computer skills in their curriculum whereas 85% of other countries do. And so one of the things we need to be talking about when we're developing policies and frameworks about healthy aging is also looking at, for all these enabling technologies, how do we improve the education systems of today to better prepare the people who will be older adults in 2050? But another thing uh, we should be talking about is what roles should family members and carers adopt? Human instinct is to um, protect the people you care about. And we're seeing in a lot of studies around cybersecurity and parental mediation that parents actively will either monitor, restrict, or engage in conversations with their children on what to do online and when not to do it. 
none, not all of these three are equal. Their effect is different um, in terms of how the teens respond to it, but also in terms of how safe it keeps the teenagers. Is it reasonable to expect that as technology gets more complex and digital skills get uh, be, need to become more diverse, children and family members, other family members and carers will adopt some kind of protective attitudes towards older adults and either try to monitor, restrict, or actively mediate? But in case they do this, what is effective in this context? You cannot rely on active mediation, for example, with an older adult suffering advanced dementia. In these cases, you would act either need to actively, uh, more actively restrict or monitor. But then there's the part of dignity again. How much control, how much access should you be able to have? Because a lot of the data generated will be private in nature. So even as we talk about digital literacy frameworks for older adults, we need to be considering the supportive community around these older adults and what are the digital literacy skills they need to be able to be an effective and, digni uh, and provide a dignified support system? So these are just some thoughts from me. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. We are running out of time, but uh, let me introduce uh, Manushi Sharma. Please condense your uh, uh, presentation, Manushi. She is from an NGO, US Partnership for Education and Sustainable Development. She's a National Climate Fellow at Northeastern University in Arlington, Virginia. Her presentation is on climate change and population aging. Go ahead, Manuji. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So today I'm going to be talking about the con two converging uh, global trends, uh, climate change and population aging. Oh, sorry. Um, I won't go deep into this. The context has been set. We are an aging um, globally. It's a trend, uh, but this is just to put another layer to this uh, uh, context of aging that what happens with climate change. And that is what I'll explain uh, in my presentation. So climate change risks may manifest as health risk, could be heat related illnesses, and especially in older people, with decreased uh, adaptation, they might suffer a lot more. Respiratory illnesses, climate change can exasperate uh, conditions like COPD, asthma. Older adults who are diabetic or obese can also face increased risk of heart attacks due to poor air quality. Uh, Vector-borne diseases or in the US, tick-related diseases also are, are more, um, uh, Sorry, sorry, older adults with weakened immune systems may be more vulnerable. Injuries and deaths in extreme weather events or environmental uh, events might be more in older adults. The mental health effects, which have been talked about in other presentation, other water-related illnesses. Um, and then to compound all of this, comorbidities add to the threat. And with climate change adding to the spice mix, it just becomes a big hot mess. Um, so older populations are vulnerable. Now, vulnerable, vulnerability is the tendency or the predisposition to be adversely affected by environmental changes through exposure, um, susceptibility to harm or, and capacity to adapt or respond to a climate change threat, which we know is exasperated in older adults because of various things that I've mentioned here and also have been mentioned by my colleagues. Um, this is just an example of how during COVID this over, how overlapping risk factors exasperated malnutrition in adults that had COVID. So socioeconomic, uh, sorry, it, their physiological vulnerabilities, chronic health conditions, social isolation, mobility limitations and cognitive challenges all sort of intersect. Um, and create a compounded set of risk factors for this vulnerable group. Um, so the challenges are that socioeconomic factors cause health inequalities widen with age. There is lack of age-inclusive healthcare and environmental justice policies. And also there's a lack of central, centrally like supported or federal supported programs for emergency preparedness, response, and recovery for older adults. 
But within this uh, challenge, additional challenge of climate change, there is also an opportunity. Both climate change and aging are long-term, complex structural transformation shaped by short-term political decisions. And this is something that can be leveraged in our policy response. Um, aging science can definitely learn from climate change science. One of the successes of climate change science is the development of clear, distinguishable framework to plan action, which it's, it divides into three major categories, adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. And much of our presentations have also like sort of talked about how we should adopt a life course approach. So this just puts things into more perspective. Um, adaptation is improving well-being of people and communities in need today. So this is what adaptation process in this flowchart is what it looks like in for climate change adaptation, but this can also incorporate more aging related considerations, such as long term care provision, poverty alleviation, crisis prevention, diagnostics, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, mitigation is ensuring that individuals and societies and institutions age better across the life course or a life course approach, which has been, uh, which Colleen and Ritu uh, had mentioned in their slides. So for instance, uh, strengthening primary health care, speciality comorbidity outpatient care, healthy lifestyle promotion, uh, financial literacy, AI literacy, um, social ca capital development, um, and resilience. Resilience is taking proactive steps to ensure that our systems and our paradigms are sustainable in the face uh, of challenges of population aging and climate change. And so this means that taking a more systems perspective uh, that from enabling that younger and older societies learn from each other to move to resilient aging future. And this is a value proposition really. Every dollar invested in resilience avoids $5 worth of future losses. Um, which brings me to an end that ensuring no one is left behind in the face of climate change is a moral imperative and a shared responsibility. Healthy aging is a cross-cutting issue that intersects with many of the sustainable development goals, including those related to poverty, health, inequality, and inclusive communities. And so by embracing the convergence of climate science and age science, we can work towards a world where the most vulnerable, especially our older adults, are empowered, supported, and included in building resilience to challenges ahead. Thank you. Well. Thank you very much. It was quite uh, 